Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This will be the sixth lecture in our wood design series. Today's wonderful music comes from the artist D. Yan He from the albums Perpetual Peace and Elegiac Symphony. Links to download the albums are included in the video description. This video is going to discuss how design codes, and particularly the NDS, handle the innate variability in wood as a material. So previously, we have discussed in great length the variability of wood as a material. The last three videos have focused entirely on types of local and global defects found in wood and wood products. These can all occur at many different sizes, orientations, and combinations. As it comes from a biological organism, wood is inherently variable. And this has inherent structural implications. A piece of lumber with many defects in it will uh, uh, invariably carry less load than an identically sized piece of lumber of the same tree species, of course, without such wood defects. Imagine for a moment that you have two columns, say each made of a pine 2x4. Uh, let's say one is clear wood and one is with one is uh, two by four with many defects. You then start piling weight on top of each, and you do so until they collapse. Um, while it's impossible to predict with one hundred percent certainty, it is it is uh, a safe bet to say that you will almost inevitably find that the defect plague column will fail long before the clear wood two by four. There are several approaches we could use to solve this problem. First, I want to look at this problem conceptually. Again, think to wood as a material. It's incredibly variable. Any given board of the same size and species could have very different strength, uh, in terms of tensile strength, compressive strength, etc., than another of the same exact size and species. So, um, why is this important? Well, think of basic structural engineering. Everything we do as structural engineers relies on knowing material strength. Before I can design a column or beam, I need to know what material I'm making it out of, and I need to know all the relevant properties of that material. With a material like steel, for example, the material properties are well known, as it is a man-made material. We directly control the amount of carbon, nickel, cobalt, etc. that goes into the material. We control the entire process from start to finish, so we directly control its material properties. But ultimately, that is not possible with wood. So, what might we do to account for this incredible variability? I would like to explore a few conceptual approaches that we might take, and then see how the actual NDS handles this. First, we could simply compensate for variability using ultra-conservative design. For example, we could find the absolute minimum strength that a 2x4 made from pine can have, and then just use that as a standard value. We could find the most not filled, split, defect plague wood we can, we can, and measure the strength of these worst possible boards, intention, compression, etc. Then we can simply use these worst case values for all pine 2x4s we might design for. Of course, this would result in structures that are massively overbuilt. The vast majority of your elements would have far more strength uh, than you assumed in your design. And this would ultimately result in hugely inflated costs, in hugely inflated environmental footprints, and use of materials. Overly conservative design is inherently wasteful. Another approach we could take would be to be extremely selective in the wood we use. For example, we might only use wood that is clear, or completely free from defects. If a board has a knot in it, it simply gets sent to the paper mill, instead of going into a building. Then our strengths would be much less variable, and we could just measure and, just, and assign certain strengths to each tree species. While this would be highly efficient in terms of material actually used in a building, it would be incredibly inefficient in terms of costs. We want to be able to use lumber with defects, knots form out of the normal growth process every tree experiences. Everywhere a tree branch is embedded, you end up with a knot. Trees grow at weird angles, producing sloped grain, warped wood, etc. If we were to be that selective with lumber to only use clear wood, we would probably have to reject 95% or more of the boards that leave the sawmill. If you would like to see what this looks like, go down to your local lumber yard and see what the price is for clear pine, 
versus say regular pine 2x4s, you'll find the cost is astronomically larger for the clear wood. Typically such wood is reserved for applications like fine furniture making. In fact, actually I decided to do just that. On the day I recorded this, I called up my local lumber yard, um, as an aside, shout out to Spath Hardware in Corvallis if anyone wants to know. I asked them what their current prices are for pine 1x6s, uh, for the two grades I know they, ca they carry, both number 2 and better and clear pine. The number 2 and better costs 40 cents per linear foot, and clear pine costs $2.70 per linear foot. That's 40 cents versus $2.70. The higher grade lumber costs over six times more. And number two isn't even the lowest grade pine around. There are lower grades that would be even cheaper, although they just don't have to carry them at this particular uh, lumber yard. So, uh, and this, co this is uh, in conflict with the types of things we do as civil engineers. Civil engineers need a lot of material for the things we build. We buy things by the ton, we need a lot of them. Um, whatever we're going to order, we're going to order by the ton, so we need a lot of it, and it has to be cheap. So because civil engineers use a lot of everything they use, the materials we use have to be cheap. The expensive clear wood might be fine for really nice furniture making, but it's not something you want to use in building your house. Another approach we could take would be to directly test every single board. For example, we, we could run every board through a strength testing machine and directly measure their tensile, compressive, etc. strengths. Then we just slap a sticker on the side that states the material properties of that particular board. Now, this sometimes is actually done to a certain extent. Provision, uh, provisions for direct mechanical testing are included in the NDS, however this is not typically used for normal construction applications. These are normally used by entities such as manufacturers of glue lamb beams. To make glue and beams, you really need to be careful uh, when you need to apply a lot of quality control uh, and you need to be very careful about the quality of your input product and direct mechanical testing is a way to ensure this and a lot of glue and manufacturers do use direct mechanical testing of their input lumber. Yet another approach we could take is lumber grading. We could rank lumber and then simply just rely on that. We could rank lumber according to a certain number of ranks, and then only use uh, lumber above a certain rating. Then we just find strength values for the lowest grade, and then all of, we know that all of the grades higher than that could be expected to have higher strength. Now, this would be certainly be more efficient than using just the lowest value across all grades of lumber, but it would still be expensive and probably overly conservative. Another approach we could take uh, in designing our structures would be to design them to be highly redundant. Uh, we could use, uh, for example, we could determine average strength values for each species and then just use far more of them than we need. If you calculate, for example, if you calculate you need 2x4s at 12 inches on center, then maybe we just put them 8 inches on center instead. Um, that would work as long as we apply a very conservative um, methodology and pr in principle that could work. However, this would probably also be far too conservative. It would be very similar to the idea of just having very conservative design. Finally, we could use statistics to determine design strengths. In other words, we perform a whole bunch of strength tests on, wood, uh, on woods of different species. Then we determine an acceptable rate of failure, as you can never make the chance totally zero. Finally, we set our code strength values sufficient that the chance of failure is below acceptable levels. You select a strength value that say 99.99% of Douglas fir 2x4s will have a higher value of, and then you use that for your design. The extreme outliers, for example the most uh, defect riddle boards, will be excluded and thus the assumed strength won't be as low as if you use the absolute minimum value. Still, even this is likely too conservative. In doing this you'd be able to exclude a few boards, but um, you'd still be including a lot of um, extremely low quality, low grade, naughty, uh, you know, just very low quality um, boards in your assumed strength curve, basically. And so it's probably not the best approach. So how do we actually do this? Uh, so each of these approaches has their own benefits and drawbacks. 
Um, some are quicker and easier to apply, but they would result in an excessively conservative design. For example, just uh, using the lowest strength values across any grade to design all of our uh, structures, um, that would be very quick to apply in design, but it would be overly conservative. Um, and then some would result in, uh, in buildings being highly material efficient, but it would be highly cost, uh, would be extremely cost inefficient to implement. For example, think back to the mechanical testing. Testing every board lets you design to that board's true strength, but such testing is very expensive to do on a very large scale. The NDS, the American Wood Council's National Design Specification for Wood Structures, uses a combined approach to solve this problem. Their methods apply many of the strategies pre we previously discussed in various combinations. The first thing the NDS relies upon that you probably already guessed from our previous discussions is wood creating. Wood is assigned strength values not just by species, but by grade. Lower grades will have lower strength values. While not as thorough or precise as direct mechanical testing of every single board, visually grading lumber is a very cost-effective method. So we'll discuss wood grading in more detail in another lecture, but for now, just know that wood is divided into certain grades, such as number one, number two, etc., and that the higher grades tend to have higher strengths and uh, also are correspondingly more expensive. And uh, in terms of numbering, generally one is the best, two is the second best, and so on, although there are some exceptions to that. Next, the NDS does rely heavily on statistical methods. For each grade and species, many strength tests were carried out. Each grade's design value is set so that an acceptably low number of boards are below this level, assuming that they assume a certain distribution of strengths, um, and then set the strength value so that very few of the boards of that grade fall below that strength value, and that's all based on just statistics to make sure that failure is below what is defined as an acceptable value. Again, an acceptable rate of failure is, is adopted, and then strengths are applied to ensure that acceptable rate of failure. Additionally, wood structures are highly redundant. Structurally, this means there are many potential paths for load to travel through the structure. In a wall with many 2x4s spaced evenly apart in a line, a load can be passed along if necessary. If one 2x4 has much less strength than predicted, the adjacent 2x4s can take up the load instead. Um, wood structures are typically not built, although there are some exceptions with, say, you know, just giant columns of huge, uh, you know, especially in light frame construction, you're not using huge wooden columns that are like 12 inches by 12 inches or something. You're using, you know, two by fours, two by sixes, things like that. You're using a larger number of smaller elements. And thus, if they have some deficiency, if, if one or two of them have some deficiency in their strength below what you predict, they can simply pass on the load to their neighboring, um, neighboring members. Finally, the NDS does use rather conservative design. The values included in the strength tables are not values directly measured from lab tests. Rather, they have been reduced by an appropriate strength factor or factors of safety. Uh, these factors can be quite large, and overall it results in wood structures being highly resilient. While the NDS isn't as conservative as some of the methods we brainstormed, it still does represent it as rather conservative in design. All right, so what we have here is table 4A from the NDS supplement, and again, we'll get into that. Uh, we'll introduce this properly in a uh, later lecture. But notice what you have here. This is reference design values for visually graded lumber, uh, two to four inches thick, all species except southern pine. So Douglas fir, cottonwood, things like that. Okay, so I just want to go down to Doug fir here, and notice what we have. We have a whole series of different grades of, um, of Douglas fir larch in this case, uh, each with different corresponding reference strength values, which we then have to apply adjustment factors to. For example, you have your bending uh, strength value, your tension parallel to grain, shear parallel to grain, compression perpendicular to grain, uh, compression uh, parallel to grain, and then modulus elasticity, specific gravity, etc. Now, um, notice here, even within the same species, we have different grades. Take a look, for example, at the immense difference in strength values, and let's look at, say, bending strength, between the various grades of lumber. 
On the low end, we have utility grade Douglas fir larch with a bending capacity of 275, and this would be pounds per square inch. And then the select structural, the highest grade, is 1500 PSI. And the only difference between these is going to be the uh, is going to be just the amount of knots and, and splits and etc. present. The utility grade is going to be the most knotty, splits, warped lumber that, that uh, comes into the sawmill, while the select structural is going to be the really nice stuff. It's going to be the clearest wood, the straightest grain, the fewest knots, etc. And so um, basically each given grain is rated visually depending on the amount of uh, both the amount and also the size and a lot of other things that we'll get into a bit later um, in a different lecture about, uh, you know, the relationship between uh, just guidelines for the number of defects of various kinds that can occur. So there'll be a standard for, there'll be a standard that, uh, for example, all number one DFLs, uh, Douglas for Larch, can't have a certain number of it or a certain size of knots uh, per foot or something like that. There'll be, there are standards set and then Anything graded with that, uh, with that grading, will meet those standards. And ultimately, that is why these have different, um, different uh, strengths. The actual material is not going to vary substantially. Like, if you, um, if you find a piece of utility grade uh, 2x4 in DFL or something, and if you were to find, like, even in a very uh, low quality piece of lumber, you could probably find, like, a, you know, a couple inch long section or something that was completely free of knots and if you did and you found like if you found like a few inch long if you made like a few inch long beam out of utility grade but you only used the very best clear sections of it and compared it to an identical sample of clear wood from a select structural and actually then tested them and say a bending test you would probably find that they have similar overall strengths however we're dealing with what value that you can assume in design so yes a very tiny section of the utility grade might have you know, um, some very high strength, but overall you can't really rely on it because it has, it's so full of various defects. And that ultimately is how, um, lumber grading is used, uh, by the NDS to, to sort lumber into different categories and then provide, uh, strength values, which are of course also have uh, some safety factors and, and statistical analysis built in. So it can be seen that the NDS uses a combined approach individual boards are graded, usually visually, then design values are assigned to those grades that use risk analysis techniques to reduce the probability of failure to an acceptably low level. And this is the basic method the NDS uses to solve the problem of lumber's inherent variability. Again, you use statistical methods to ensure reliability, uh, graded lumber to make predictions more granular, redundancy to account for outliers, and conservative design as an overall hedge against uncertainty. Put together, they result in structures that are safe to live and work in, and are also highly resilient. In later videos, we will discuss both the history of the NDS and how lumber is graded, but we'll wrap up here for today. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the, in the comments below. If you found this useful or illuminating, uh, please like and subscribe to make the robots happy. If you would like to help make content like this possible, Please see the link to our Patreon page in the video description, and feel free to check out the many other structural design videos and series we have on this channel. Regardless, I hope you found this useful, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. I hope to see you all then, and hope to see you all soon, and as always, thank you.